Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bono, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So today on our podcast, my guest is Tammy Rees from productleadercoach.com, where she helps product leaders be awesome. Thank you for joining us, Tammy. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me, Tatiana. Excited to be here. Let's start with my first classic question. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how did you get to do what you do today? So I am a product person, which means I'm a strategy person. I have worked within technology companies for something like 18 years uh, as both an in-house person and a consultant and a variety of other things within that umbrella. And uh, January of 2021, I opened Product Leader Coach, uh, which is a boutique coaching thing where you get to have one-on-one coaching sessions for me designed for product leaders, whether they are executives or up-and-coming leaders. Um, And I also do training and other things that are product leader related to help people accelerate their careers and be awesome. Wonderful. Before we get into more of what you do, uh, you just mentioned your domain name. It's a very kind of a category defining keyword rich name. How did you get, like, what was the reasoning behind getting it and choosing that as your brand name? Well, I can tell you there are a lot of people who are jealous that I actually have. (laughs) I think I also own the productleadercoach.com just to (laughs) double in case you understand why that's valuable. Um, I also actually own like 10 more things like myproductleadercoach.com and techproductleadercoach.com so that no one else can steal part of my branding. Uh, But What happened was, was I had a role where I was called the chief product officer in residence at a investment uh, venture capital private equity firm called Insight Partners, which is very big in the tech space. And uh, while I was doing that, I had many different hats I wore and many different roles I had. I was creating content. I was interim head of product at certain companies. Uh, within their portfolio. But my favorite thing that I was doing was working one-on-one with executives who were VP of product or CPOs and helping them elevate their game. Because it turns out the higher up you get in an organization, the less you can turn to your boss for advice. Mm -hmm. And so I, as an outside third party, became this really wonderful person to throw ideas against a wall with, to see where there were blind spots. And I loved it. And I also loved my job. So I wasn't changing, but I said, at some point, this is, this adventure is going to be over. And I made a conscious choice in something like December of 2019, it's 2018, 2018. Um, I, I looked up recently when I purchased it, it was like November or December of 2018. And I said, I'm enjoying this so much, but I know the next chapter I want to have is to be a product leader coach. And let me be clear, product leader coach was not a thing in November, 2018. (laughs) Like since COVID happened, a lot of people have changed their careers to become a coach, Mm. got laid off and all of these things. But when I chose that domain, no one really was doing product coaching. There were a lot of people who were doing consulting and otherwise, but the idea of an executive coach that specialized in product management was totally Mm. fair. And so uh, I was able to buy productleadercoach.com and the productleadercoach.com. And and so it was my way of putting my stake in the ground, even for myself, the same same way people write notes. And if if you write something down, it becomes more concrete. To me, Mm. buying the URL was the concrete thing that I had to, I had to at least try it whenever Mm. my next chapter was available. I love that. And I think a lot of people consciously are not do that. Like I've I've, I've done it myself as well. I'm I'm sure we're all guilty of it. And not all of those ideas materialize, but there is that that idea of, you know, once you get it, you're like, okay, that's that's the first step is there. It's like a commitment that you're making to yourself, I guess, as much as anything else. 100%. I also bought, I'm working on a children's book around product management called- Oh, really? What do wow. product managers do? 
And I think I bought that one a while ago and it still <laughs> needs to be used to actually publish the book. But it's it's there's something about knowing that you've put this thing out in the ether that you have to actually fill the you have to fill it up with code, you know, mm. like you have to create a site for it at some point, even if it's just a single landing page. Um, but there's there's an intentionality in it that kind of holds mm. you accountable that you have to fill it. Mm. Yes, exactly. It's that it's that I, I think there was a very cool um quote i'm not gonna get it like word for word now but the the founder of uh, sumo.com and they they actually made a whole page on their website because before that they were uh sumome.com and then they upgraded at some point to sumo.com and it was like a seven figure amount i think it was 1.5 million or something they paid for the domain name and usually People are kind of shying away of saying how much they paid because, like, what are our users, what are our our employees gonna say, what are our you know investors gonna say? Like, we spend all that money on a domain name. They actually made a really cool uh, page on their website where they're explaining the reasoning and what else they could have done with that money, but they put it in the you know domain name basically to as a statement to say we are staying here and that's making your life easier. And I think that's really cool, like a next level game on, on that commitment and really showing it. Yeah, I've been part of a few experiences around domain names. So when I worked for Cornerstone On Demand, which is an enterprise SaaS company, um, for I think our 10 year anniversary as a company, we bought csod.com instead of cornerstoneondemand.com because every <laughs> URL was cornerstoneondemand.com slash whatever their name was. Yeah. And like everyone would always mistype something. And so CSOD was so much shorter and it was announced at the 10 year anniversary and you've never heard a crowd go more wild. Like, <laughs> And, Very like, cool. and all of your email addresses are now going to be at csod.com, which was such a yeah. shift when you were a salesperson or, and you have to like spelling out all of that, you know, every yeah, time. And absolutely. So that was really cool. And I was part of a startup called Moto, M-O-T-O, that mm. did cars and they bought moto.com from somebody else on like a multi-year lease. Mm-hmm. Like it was like a multi-year payment to, cause it was such an expensive URL. Mm -hmm. about moto means pot, like marijuana in, I think Spanish or something else. Or yeah, it's, like, I know it's like a slang <laughs> pot. So like, okay. <laughs> like, especially with like the weed evolution that was coming was this very uh, valuable URL. Um, so I remember that. And then um, I was part of a marketing team for a university and I learned that you can only have one .edu per year per university. Oh wow! I yeah. didn't actually know that. I know they use the .edu, but I didn't know they can only have one. Wow. Yeah, it's possible that that's an antiquated rule, but there used to be a rule that mm. um, you could only have one. Because I was trying to buy a new one, like that was more marketing friendly than ajula.edu. Okay. Because <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> explain anything, and people really yeah. a jula. Which is still, <laughs> um, I learned that Getty is the only organization that has a .edu that isn't a university or like educational institution because of uh -huh. the amount of research they do. And I think they bought it before people made rules. Um, and then there was some other story. Oh, I, I, there's a venture firm called Brooklyn Bridge Ventures, and they had invested in a web app called clubhouse that i've actually used and loved as project management software and when clubhouse app the like audio app social app mm -hmm. that came mm -hmm. years ago during the pandemic came out and they exploded they actually bought clubhouse.com from this other startup so that people would be less confused and that was mm -hmm. an awesome thing for this SaaS app to just have a lot of income and they changed their name to why am I blanking on their name now? But they, I, th they I think we wrote oh, about that, but I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know, but um, app, uh, I don't, oh, I need to know what it was called now. Okay, I'll look it up. But yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, I'll figure it out. Um, yeah, anyway, well, it was so cool a lot of have, stories. Yeah, they they got a lot of 
money for their company because of that. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 there's so many, yeah. Yeah. That's another thing that there's so many well, things, but yeah, that's another thing that's not much spoken about when, when you have a valuable name, that's, you know, keyword rich, short, brandable dictionary words, those things. Well, I mean, even if the business fails, it's obviously nobody, you know, wants that to happen, but reality is a lot of startups fail. That's still an asset that you can resell and people don't often think about that. 100%. And in this case, it really helped extend their runway. So it's called shortcut. Mm -hmm. I knew it was something also nice and it still communicated something around their brand, which is that they help things go move. No, that's actually very cool. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to Clubhouse, which is around the people on your team, but it, it they they worked closely to make sure that their replacement brand was still a good one, and it was good for them too because they were sick of being confused with the social media app, yeah, like, it was absolutely. a serious business application. And so there's there's lots of cool things that happen in URLs. Mm, very cool. I, I love those stories. I, I love that. And I, I think one thing that you just mentioned that a lot of people don't realize, and a lot of people. Um, struggle exactly as you said. When I speak to people, a lot of entrepreneurs feel like almost guilty. Like, I mean, what are my employees going to say if I invest in that? Like, you know, is it going to look like money bad spent? When the reality is what you just said, I speak to so many people who are struggling to communicate their own brand name <laughs> to people, especially the marketing and sales department. It's just like talk to them. You know, they're going to tell you what they're going to think about that upgrade. <laughs> And what you you have to think about it as you're removing friction, right? Mm. You're removing friction for your employees, you're removing friction for your prospects, you're removing friction for your clients, and you're making it easier for people to give referrals and otherwise. And there's a lot of value in removing friction. Because Absolutely. if you've got a prospect and they and you call you cold call them and they say, Oh yeah, I'm gonna email you, and you spell out your email address and they can't remember that, that it's a Y instead of an I for a word like Miami or whatever it is that you <laughs> and and then you have someone who sends an email and it bounces, they're probably not going to follow up. Like mm. you've now wasted yeah. an opportunity because you've made it too high friction for someone to actually connect with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's business loss. That's money lost and not even going to go into marketing. I think that we're doing an article on the Super Bowl ads um, and they, there's the majority do have the domain names, right? But there are, I think there's one for sure that like they spend, I don't know how much on the adverts and on the screen time and they don't have the domain name that exactly matches the brand name. And it's like, what are you doing? Where are those people going to go after they look at that? <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. I'm just still shocked by the Kanye um, commercial. So. Oh, yeah. I didn't say, I don't know. Actually, we have, you know, we really see FT members who are writing an article about all of those adverts. I still haven't seen the article, so I still haven't seen the ads. <laughs> so there's a Kanye ad for Yeezy.com, and it, it just comes off as him being very crazy. He's in the back of a cab with his phone. And this is the sort of thing where it's so low budget, it somehow works and it, people are talking. Yeah. About it. <laughs> um, he's like on his phone and he's like, we spend so much money on the ad. We have no money for production. So like my website is this and you should go there because we have shoes. Yeah. Other things, it's shoes. And that's it. <laughs> like that's the entire commercial. Um, um I'm not going to say his website because I think that there's a lot of, I would prefer to cancel Kanye right now. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I didn't even know. Honestly, I'm going to sound like somebody who's living under a brick or something. Oh, no, but no, I didn't no, even no. know that's, yeah, I didn't even know he still exists, his brand. So that's okay. totally fair. Um, the other thing URL wise that I do not understand why not, why every professional has not done is the LinkedIn vanity URL. Mm. If I get sent someone's LinkedIn profile and it's like XYZ 2743 A, A dot, I am like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. it takes three seconds to change your thing. I think some people don't even know you can. That's true. Do you know what I've noticed? Uh, and like, like a note to any listeners, sometimes, a lot of times, people create some crazy 
you know, the initial LinkedIn profile they create and it stays there and they I don't forget it and don't don't notice it. But some, sometimes there are things that are not even their name. It's just like crazy stuff from their past. You their know? AIM name. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know this, this, this weird stuff like that. Just like, okay. I see you. <laughs> yeah yeah oh my god oh dear all right let's let's talk about um yeah let's talk about what you do <laughs> yeah. um so what yeah well, we can talk about domains forever um you mentioned you as uh, i really like that point you mentioned as people go higher up in the in their positions in the company it gets harder to ask for advice and and that's that's one of those things where when you say it, it's so obvious, but you actually don't think about it until you hear it. So that's, let's say that's one of the issues that you help people solve. What are the like most common things that you experience people reach out to you for? Uh, so most commonly, I'm working with a head of product who wants to kick butt at what their job is. And there really just aren't that many peers to talk to. They can't talk to their boss for every question because that diminishes trust and confidence in their leadership. Mm. So that's not good. Or you're an up and coming product leader and you want to build that trust and confidence. And you know, if you constantly are turning to your boss for advice or you don't necessarily present yourself after some polishing, you will not build that trust and confidence that you need in order to get promotions, uh, et cetera. So that's in general what I help people with. It's amazing how often the most simple thing people don't think about. I had this fantastic, fantastic person who I've been working with for years on and off. She was my first client who signed up with me. And at some point she said to me, Tammy, I've been giving board presentations on product management for a decade now. And I do not know if my slides are good because I've never seen <laughs> anyone else's slides. <laughs> Everything's confidential. It's a board meeting deck. And yeah. <laughs> I, said, I said to her, I said, you know, who does know? And she said, no. And I said, your board members, they probably sit on other boards. So mm. sit down and, and say to them, I've been doing this for you for two and a half years or whatever it was for that particular company. How can I make this better? Where am I knocking mm. it out of the park? And where are there opportunities where I could serve your needs better when I'm providing you these slides? And she was like, oh my God, user feedback from my board members who are my users. And I was like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I, I've told that story, I don't know, a hundred times because it's, it's, this is a skill she has, you know, product management is a lot of user feedback. You just have to change your reference point. Mm, absolutely. And, um, I worked with a, a VP of product while I was actually at Insight Partners. He was one of the reasons I chose to open Product Leader Coach. His name is Kevin Broom. And he was proposing a, a big investment to the board of something like multiple millions of dollars for a new product initiative. And I said, well, part of what you have to show them is that you've explored other options, right? That this wasn't the first mm. idea that came to your mind and then you're going for it. And so we brainstormed what the other options were and why they weren't appropriate for their um for their situation and that became a like a very awesome tool called the 16 strategies for growth you know that <laughs> i then put up on my blog because it was something of value to many different leaders and mm. but when i talk to people who are more junior and i actually am about to i think i just published this blog post last week uh, about how one question that can change your relationship with your manager and that is rather than going to them with only a problem, which I think everyone knows not to do, or a problem with a fully baked solution, mm. you go to them with a problem and a mostly baked solution. And you say, I only have so much context. You have more context than I do. What adjustments should I make based on what you know to these plans to make it more successful? And when mm. you ask that question, you're coming off as this balance of hubris and humility where you have, I'm confident in the plan we made and I've done my homework, but I'm mm. also humble enough to know I will never know everything. And I'm turning to you as my manager and my advisor and my mentor to provide me with guidance on how to do better because I care about success more than I care about it being my idea. And that mm. works anywhere along the lines of your <laughs> career growth. But if you learn that earlier on, 
it it really builds a strong relationship in a way mm. you can't even begin to imagine like the ripple effects of. Mm. Absolutely. And how does the process work? Like somebody reaches out to you, what what does it look like? Um, more often than not, someone is either referred to me by one of my other clients or they see an article I've written and they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in getting a coach. Um, on my website, there are Calendly links that people can schedule a half hour with me. We talk about what their challenges are and why they would be looking for a coach. I talk about what coaching is like and why it's different than other things and why coaching with me is different because I do part coaching, part consulting in that if you ask me about org design, I'm not just going to tell you random theoretical stuff. I'm going to give you real advice about how to design your organization for what you need because I have this consulting background and then I follow up with emails and contracts and proposals and some people close and some people forget to send me the email that they're interested. <laughs> and today I got an email and they said, I'm so sorry, Tammy, this has been in draft for two weeks. I never press send. I'm super <laughs> started with you. And I said, great, I'm happy to work with anybody whenever they're ready. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Cool. And, and then people become uh, clients. That's yeah. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> and is it a like an ongoing thing? You mentioned to, just now that you had that client that's been with you for years on and off. Or how does it usually look like? Uh, the most common thing for people to do is to buy a package I created, which is one twice a month for three months. And that's a really good, it's a quarter of your life. You're dedicating the time for personal growth, for deep diving into interpersonal relationships you have with coworkers and how to advance them, how to really like lay the foundation for stronger moving forward. And then after that, most people switch over to once a month for around six months, which really becomes once every other-ish month. I'm really, <laughs> my clients. it's really about me being there when they, when need. they need it. And so in this case, this person and I work together closely for three months and then we spread it out. And then probably once every five or six months, she says, don't you just love when your clients are quiet for five months and then they come to you with an absolute like shit show of a problem and they need help. <laughs> I, do. Like, I love that because it <laughs> with the tools that you know how to do your job well, but you value my advice so that when you come to your next mountain of challenge, you know, I'm a good person to call for advice. I love that. Like mm. it makes me so happy. Absolutely. It also means they're developing and growing because if they're doing the same thing over and over again, they wouldn't be coming back like in six months. Exactly. Obviously. They've got a new challenge they're approaching and they're humble enough again to say, I can't do this alone and be as mm. successful as possible. I will probably be successful enough. But if I get some advice, if I talk this through with somebody else, I have a better chance of achieving my outcomes, of getting to my goals. And that's really valuable. Mm. You've mentioned a few times now in different um, topics we discussed the word humble. What do you feel are good qualities of a good product leader? So I call it humility here, but otherwise I call it the growth mindset. So the growth mindset is the concept that wherever I am now, there's an opportunity to be better in whatever mm -hmm. that is. There are more skills. There are more opportunities to learn about technology, different company styles, different ways to buy a URL or acquire different companies or how mergers and acquisitions work. Or There's so many different things that, as you noted, you, you can be growing and learning about. So that growth mindset to me is involved in humility. It also plays a role when it comes to working with team members. So as a leader, you're most probably managing team members and teaching managers how to better manage more junior folks, because uh, there's probably multiple layers in your organization if you're a VP or a chief product officer. And so humility also comes to play in the nature of empathetic leadership and empowering teams. And what you're saying is, is I now have this 10,000 foot view or 1,000 foot view, depending on my level, but other people are on the ground. I'm not talking to customers every day the way they are. I'm not working mm. with technology every day the way they are. I let the people at their own level make the decisions. Um, there's a, a gentleman named Adam Harmitz, who's a VP of product at Microsoft. 
And he wrote something called the product leaders serenity prayer. And I'm not going to get the first two points uh, correct. Cause one of them's like, let me be wise enough to see the trends. Let me uh, empower. And then the second one's like, let me empower the teams who know the details or something like that. And then the knowledge to know the difference um, because a lot of leadership is setting a high level goal, but letting the other people who are more in the everyday weeds to do their jobs mm. to say, I'm not as good at doing their job anymore. Like, yeah, Absolutely. Sure, I could probably write a user story, but I'm kind of out of practice. I'm rusty at that. Mm. And it's oh, not to mention of my time. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I think that, that and it, it's very hard to let go of those things sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, what you just said on, on the, you know, people getting rusty, I think that was going to be my next question. Question: How do you feel have, have things changed over time, even though you, you know, you just fully focused on that uh, recently, but you, you have been in the space and, and you have been eyeing that as an idea. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one of the things that changed is how quickly things change. <laughs> I think you, you're out of whatever you're in as a like focus of your work. If you're out of it, sometimes even a few months, it feels like, like you have to learn everything again. That is accurate. Um, what's cool about technology is if you are involved in technology, you're always learning. Mm -hmm. And so um, your mindset has to be technology is going to change at the speed of light and I'm going to learn about something and someone else is going to learn about something else. Um, but to own where your knowledge base is, and sometimes that's in processes and sometimes that's in a particular vertical, like education or financial technology or in AI and how it applies to different things. Uh, there's there's lots of opportunities for growth. And I think that what's cool about being a product person is that we're problem solvers and we're data synthesizers. And so our brains work in a way of system thinking. And so it may not be an area where we have expertise, but more often than not, if you are a strong product person, you can relatively quickly ramp up on whatever problem set is there mm. because you're going to ask the right sort of questions to understand things. But I have been told by clients and other people that I get there a little faster. And I think that comes from my consulting background, that mm. as a consultant, you're trained to get there faster. And so, um, and I have exposure to so many different business models and things of that sort. But I think that product people in general can switch between industries uh, because of that mindset of asking the right questions, getting to the root of the problem and looking for sustainable solutions. Mm, absolutely. You just mentioned AI. How has it affected your particular line of work, if at all? Um, so I think what's interesting is how many people are looking for training on AI right now for their mm. team. And it's not something I offer because I don't have it as an expertise. Um, how many companies are building something with AI simply because it's what you're supposed to do, not because they are figuring out how to deliver value to customers. And so mm. blow up in people's faces. Um, it doesn't really affect me very much other than occasionally someone literally yesterday, there was a mid-level product manager who was introduced to me um, as a potential coach. And he's working on this AI product that's very cool. And I said to him, I said, I'm happy to help you, but I need to be honest, I've never managed an AI product. And there are a lot of similarities between other things. And I know enough about AI and machine learning to give you a, a certain amount of guidance. But it, if you want someone who has done exactly what you're doing to be <clears> your <throat> coach, I, I have a friend who this is what they do. And I'm happy to introduce you. And he said, no, I don't think I need that. I think I need general product management stuff first. And I said, great, I'm happy to be that person. And if there's ever something I feel out of my depth, I'll just call my friend. And he said, great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's going to happen more and more. And I think that a lot of people are losing their jobs to AI, but there's, yeah, there's, there's shifts going. I'm, I, I am not one who has a crystal ball. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the, 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 that has been the case with a lot of different technologies. So I guess just yeah, it's the next one and, and 
we're going to have to adapt and, and live with it. And, and, and use it. I, I literally have on my calendar today to look over some code that someone else developed that she trained an AI to write an email course for her. Like one of those like email funnel courses. And I'm like, okay. if I could do that based on a few articles, that would actually be a good funnel thing for me to have on my website. Hmm. To people. And I don't have the time to write a full email course. And mm-hmm. so I might do it. We're going to see. Well, that'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. Maybe, maybe next time we talk, you're going to tell me how that works. <laughs> yeah, I once had an argument with a cousin of mine that my job couldn't be replaced by AI because he believes all jobs can be replaced by AI. Okay. And I said, I actually can't be replaced by AI. And he said, anybody can. And I said, do you know what I do? And he said, no, but I believe I can. Like, yeah. I said, well, I give individualized coaching based on the things I know about the world. And he said, well, that could probably be done through algorithm. I said, absolutely. I said, what about public speaking? Inspirational public speaking. Mm. I, said, I can't imagine anybody watching a computer or a hologram of a fake person reading an AI script, being overly excited. <laughs> <laughs> and inspired by what they're listening to and he said yeah. i'm sure there's a way but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna ask how old is he <laughs> you know he's he's early 30s late 20s he's, he's yeah. in the school, right and it's the sort of thing where you know he's not, probably not intellectually wrong you know like if you did the mathematics <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think that all of us don't want to believe that could be true Mm. <laughs> yeah no i don't think i don't think so i think it's uh, yeah we, we we're gonna get better at using it and it's gonna get better at producing results but it's enhancing human um interaction and human performance i don't think it will be replacing it um i once heard a talk when i was at i went to a talk when i was living in new york at the 92nd street y and I think his first name is Gary, but his last name is Kurzweil. He's the chief futurist at Google at the time. And he was talking about how what people really don't understand about the AI curve is that it's a logarithmic curve, exponential curve, not logarithmic, mm. exponential curve, which means that like it might have been slow to get started. But now that it's mm. seen, it's going to rocket ship up because of mm. the how it works and that the speed of advancement only accelerates the more it's there and so what might have originally taken 10 years to do one thing and then five mm. years to the next eventually is going to be a matter of days of changes that like mm. advancements are happening and i don't think we are ready for that mm. i need some coaches for that <laughs> 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 oh dear yeah. yeah okay last thing last thing last thing you did mention the book and I, I cannot not ask you about the kids book like like that's the last thing I would have thought you know product leader coaching kids book like what's that about uh so I'm actually working on two books one is for children and it's because I have two toddlers and I wanted to be able to explain what product managers do to them you, you want to explain to them what you do my mommy does, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, what mommy does <laughs> I mean my dad still calls me a project manager sometimes uh, <laughs> but um but also it's called what do product managers do a primer for aspiring pms of all ages and parents who aren't sure it's a real job <laughs> that's very cool <laughs> and it's it's mostly done it needs to be edited to be more of a narrative it's illustrated it'll probably be a youtube video before it's a book but it'll i'll will read and flip the pages virtually and then i'm also working on a book called where to which is more of a business book and it's where to how outcome oriented thinking gets you where you want to go and that's mm-hmm. all about setting goals and being intentional as we talked about earlier um with your decisions in business, in life, in relationships, et cetera, so that you are making them with a frame of reference of what will eventually lead me to the outcome I desire, as opposed to making a feasibility question, instead focusing mm. on the valuability of something. Mm. That's very cool. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be interesting. Cool. When do you think you'll like release that? Or oh, you're not sure yet? So, the children's book I'm hoping to get out as soon as possible. I have an editor helping me with the narrative thing. 
And the business book, what I'm doing right now, actually, so anybody on this podcast can um, send me an email and I will send them a link. I'm trying to give the talk, which is the talk version of the book, a hundred times this year and mm. so set up a Calendly link where any organization, as long as your group is like 30 people or less, can hire me to give the virtual talk for free so that I get more iterations under my belt and I see which stories resonate with people. And, you know, I'm very product managing user feedback oriented around these things. <laughs> so that's if, if anybody wants me to come talk to their organization, I have like 10 slots already filled and I'm happy to do 90 more. Very cool. All right. We, we, we'll definitely include some information on that in the write-up uh, for the podcast. I think that'll be very fun and I think it will be interesting for some people. And, and maybe someone will share a story that I end up putting in the book. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Well, that's been an absolute pleasure. Tell me, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the two books now. <laughs> this was super fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.